going to start officially in a couple of minutes. Time for me to do some introduction and give time to those uh, latecomers to arrive. I know it's raining and you know how it is traffic when it rains in Washington DC. So people are often late. Um, I am absolutely honored to have uh, Marc Polidotti back at the Alliance and Nicolas again because he's been here as well uh, before for the Cine Club, which was yesterday. And Marc was here with us about three years ago when we held an event about Patrick Modiano one year after he had been awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, Marc is, uh, I will tell you about his bio, but he was here because he has translated Modiano. You can see some of the examples here, one of them, as well as the most recent Goncourt uh, by Eric Villard uh, that Marc translated as well. So tonight we have Nicolas Elliott, who has been uh, the New York correspondent for the French magazine Cahier du Cinéma since 2009. And that is why we have this partnership, Alliance Française Cahier du Cinéma, the Cine Club, for the last three years. He is a contributing editor for film at Bond magazine, and his writing on film has also appeared in Film Comment, Four Columns, an anthology on the works of Chantal Ackerman and Philippe Garel. He is also a translator, and his translations from French to English include The Falling Sky by Davy Kopenawa and Bruce Albert, Michel Winock's biography of Flaubert, and The Hatred of Literature by William Marx, all published by Harvard University Press, as well as Dura Godard Dialogues, forthcoming from the film desk. Marc Polizotti is the publisher and editor-in-chief at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and pri prior to becoming the Met's publisher in 2010, he worked as a translator and editor of numerous exhibition catalogues, including several dedicated to the work of French artists, such as the private collection of Edgar Degas in 97, Cézanne to Van Gogh, the collection of Dr. Gachet in 99, and Pierre Bonnard, the late Still Lives and Interior in 2009. He has authored several books, including Revolution of the Mind, The Life of André Breton in 95, and a monograph on the French poet Lautré Hamon, and he has translated more than 40 French books, including the works of Gustave Flaubert, André Breton, Marguerite Durat, and Raymond Roussel. Uh, of course, like I mentioned before, Patrick Modiano, whose Nobel Prize, and uh, recently Eric Villard, Eric Villard, who uh, was also awarded the Goncourt um, uh, last year. Marc received a bachelor's degree in French and comparative literature from Yale University in 79, and a master's degree in French literature from Columbia University in 83. He is also the member of the French Voices Jury, which supports American publishers and translators to make the best of French contemporary writing available in the US. And in 2016, he was awarded the insignia of the Chevalier of the Order of Arts et Lettres that uh, was given to him by the French government. And um, without further ado, I will leave you in conversation, but not lost into translation, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, our two translators and authors. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Sarah. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you tonight in conversation with Mark Polizotti who has been, uh, for me as a translator, uh, intimidating inspiration for some years because he has tackled such works as Flaubert, Bouvard and Pécuchet and writings by Raymond Roussel. Uh, I myself have primarily been uh, a translator of non-fiction and I started off working as a translator really to pay the bills and I did some books that were not noble, um, histories of certain specific handbags, treatises on uh, different kinds of bushes, in other words, low-grade coffee table books. And in the last five or six years, I've started translating um, books that I find more interesting and more involving, but non-fiction. And I've studiously avoided asking myself many of the questions that Mark raises in this fascinating book, Sympathy for the, Tra for the Traitor, a translation manifesto. Um, what I found reading this book is that Mark takes a common sense approach to translation. He describes it even as an anti-theory. Um, and he brings up uh, what I find a, a very powerful point, which is that translators are creative artists in their own right. 
And I think that this is an important thing to recognize because as Mark very ably shows in this book, uh, translators have not always been recognized as artists and maybe their rights even as human beings have not always been recognized and some translators over the years have been executed for various crimes uh, related to their translations and even today translation remains a, a very thorny controversial issue and that's what Mark gets at in this book by really looking at this debate that exists in the both the actual translation community and the translation theory community and beyond, which has many different names. The debate could be posited as literal versus liberal, fidelity versus felicity, perfectionist versus maverick, St. Augustine versus St. Jerome, or Vladimir Nabokov versus Ezra Pound. Anyhow, this book is a wonderful digest of everything that one could want to consider regarding translation. So without further ado, I think I'm going to let Mark read an excerpt from the book um, to give you a taste of what he's doing here. And then uh, we'll start a conversation. I'll ask a few questions. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Um, good evening. Thank you for coming out in the rain. I assume it's still raining. Uh, Nicholas, sometime I'll have to tell you about the weekend that I spent translating a, a user's guide to earwax remover. So if you think that, <laughs> I'm interested. It, it can definitely get lower than puppy TV books. Um, I hope you don't mind. I, I, I would just begin by reading a couple of pages to set the tone, and then uh, we'll take it off from there. It would be utopian to pretend that the reader of a translation is truly experiencing the original, or that in the reading of any translation there isn't a degree of difference, difference rather than loss, between the text being translated and the translation itself. The heart of the matter lies in whether we conceive of a translation as a practical outcome or an unattainable ideal. If the latter, then the inherent and inevitable flaws of the translation enterprise would, in fact, make the entire effort seem futile, but couldn't one say the same of any piece of writing? When I translate Patrick Modiano, with his deceptively plain-spoken style, I try to absorb his sensibility, internalize his structure, plot, characterization, syntax, rhythm, all the elements that Modiano put into creating his text, so as to deliver to his English-language readers the same reading experience as is had by their French-language counterparts. Needless to say, that's a pipe dream. For one thing, languages, as we know, are not just collections of definitions and grammatical rules, but instead are conditioned by a host of other factors, history, culture, usage, literary tradition, politics, chance occurrence, even something as inane as the latest celebrity scandal. And all of these factors cause words and phrases to have their own resonance, their own subtext, which moreover evolves over time. For another, and perhaps more to the point, the translated text is a collaboration. It's not the same as the original, but is by necessity a reinterpretation, a second writer's reading and recreation of the first writer's sentences. In other words, an unavoidably subjective process. Which is why, when I talk about Modiano's English readers, I really mean ours, his and mine. Arguably, it is this constantly shifting balance between objective, objective fact, the text to be translated, and subjective interpretation, a given translator's uh, version of it, that accounts for this persistent, the persistence and vehemence of the conviction that translation is inherently impossible. It rests on a conception of human language that considers fear of information, or, as David Bell has put it, a desire to believe, despite all evidence to the contrary, that words are at bottom the names of things. As Bellas notes, this conception goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, in which Adam sets about naming every living creature, which begs the question of how Adam would have named a particular shade of blue hovering over the Paris skyline at dusk, or the feeling of melancholy that might visit you at that hour. Nor does it account for the fact that even supposedly straightforward nouns, such as dog, have different resonances in different cultures, even if they designate the same species. And finally, it leaves aside the fact that, as a translator, my choice of rendering the French word chien as dog, hound, cur, pooch, canine, or mutt, will alter the feel of my English sentence, 
and that one of my tasks is to decide which of those options is the most appropriate to the given context. Language is not all about designation. Its real meanings often hover in the spaces between utterances, in the movement ger uh, generated by particular arrangements of words, associations, and hidden references. This is what literature does in the best of cases, and it's what translation can do as well. Thank you, Mark. So, I think as this passage just suggested, um, translation is no light or easy man matter. And so I want to start with a very basic question for you, which is, what draws you to a work? What makes you want to translate a work into English? And what do you think you can bring to a translation? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's really the central question of, of any translation and any choice of translation. Um, you know, I, I should preface this by saying that I'm very fortunate. I have a day job at, at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, so I don't live as a translator the way a number of colleagues do. Um, what that means is that I'm in a very enviable position of being able to choose whether or not I take a, a text on. What makes me decide to want to do one is, uh, it's a couple of things. Um, you know, I feel that to really create a successful translation, in the best of cases, you have to try to get under the skin of that text. You have to un try to understand where the original author is coming from. What was the mechanism of this text? What was it that generated it? What are the wellsprings that lead to the particular choices of words and phrasings that the author uses? Because, of course, no matter what goes into a text, no matter how much soul and how much invention and how much, um, uh, you know, the authors of the author's experience, the way that that is being conveyed to you, the reader, is words. The author has one medium through which to do this, these funny little black and white signs on a page. And the translator has exactly the same medium, words. Different language, different culture, but nonetheless, little signs on a page. And so what I try to do is understand, by almost strip down what's going on in the original text so that I could then try to regenerate that, recreate it, reproduce it in another language, another culture, sometimes another time period. Uh, you know, certainly another context than the one that in, in which it was created. So that ultimately, as I, as I said a little bit jokingly, it's a pipe dream, but at the same time, it's the goal that we keep striving toward, which is to, um, to create a text that will have the same effect on you, the English language reader, as it did, for example, on the, on the French language reader, insofar as I can interpret what that was, and insofar as I myself am a reader of both the French and the English, and sort of use myself as a test case to figure out okay, I feel this way reading the French, do I feel this way reading my English? That's, that's always a, a great gauge. So um, to answer your, your question, Nicholas, I think it, you know, it really is, if I feel in the best of cases, that kind of instinctive connection with the text, and I've been lucky enough that there have been texts that I absolutely have, Modiano was one, uh, Jean Echnoz is another. Um, I remember the first uh, uh, book by Jean Echnoz, if you haven't read him, by the way, you should, he's wonderful. Um, uh, that I read when I first discovered it back in the 1980s, I found myself translating entire pieces of the book in my head as I was reading. And that to me is always one of the, one of the great tip-offs that this is something I'm interested in translating. I wasn't planning on asking this, but as I heard you say that, I just wanted to ask you, have you ever been scared of something? Like, have you ever read a text and wanted to translate and, it, and at the same time told yourself, oh, this is too hard, or this is crazy, or this is terrifying? Um, well, there was, yes, the, 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 the case of the, the, the real terror was uh, translating Flaubert. Um, <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah, I know, exactly. Go figure, right? Um, you know, because with, with all of the mythology and all of the history and all of the weight of, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the right, the architect of the mot juste, I mean, I just felt as if he were sitting there on my shoulder, like this little homunculus, the entire time that I was, uh, that I was translating Bouvard and Bécuchet, just going, you know, you know, and, and you really do feel the weight of that, that history and of that presence, and of course, there have been other translations of, of all of his books, that one uh, included, I think there were three or four by the time I, I was commissioned to, to do mine, uh, which I studiously avoided reading because I didn't want to be swayed by them and I, or, or discouraged by them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I like to think, and I hope this doesn't sound too pompous, that when I actually did go back and look at some of them after the fact, that I thought, oh, I, I did a better job with that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, but it could easily have been the other way around. Um, and I think, you know, the, the um, the fear and the intimidation, I think, you know, probably it was the most acute for Flaubert, just because of 
because it was cool air. Um, but I think you feel that with, I feel that with pretty much any author because there, there's a sense of responsibility and there's a sense of, of um, you know, you're beholden to this author for having, first of all, created this work that you want to invest this kind of energy and this kind of, this kind of time into, and that you have a responsibility to then represent that work in a way that is credible and believable and accurate to whatever that means. And, you know, that, that, that brings to my English readers the spirit and the substance and, and the spark and the life uh, and the joy of, of what it is that I found in the original. And I just want to vouch for the fact that Mark was not being pompous when he <laughs> talked about his translation of Bouvard and Bécuchet in comparison to previous translations because there's a wonderful passage in this book where Mark takes one passage and looks at it in all the translations. And I'm not going to make the, the value judgment that his is by far the best of the four, but you do so specifically show us the thinking behind all your word choices that you make a, a very convincing argument. I mean, could I read maybe this section? Does that seem... I will. I think it's on page 104. Let's see if I'm right. I'm wrong. No, I'm right. Um, so I'm going to read the, the, these bits. This is from an anonymous translation published in 1904. Nature seemed to have destined him for stilts, for he immediately made use of the great model with flat boards four feet from the ground, and balanced thereon, he stalked over the garden like a gigantic stork taking exercise. This is by T.W. Earp and G.W. Stonier, 1954. Nature seemed to have destined him for them, for he immediately used the large model with treads four feet above the ground, and balancing on them, he stalked about the garden like a gigantic crane out walking. This is from A.J. Kralsheimer's version of 1976. Nature seemed to have destined him for that, for he at once used the large size with footrests four feet above the ground, and balancing on them, he strode up and down the garden like some gigantic stork out for a walk. And, for good manager, here is mine from 2005. Nature seemed to have predestined him for these. He immediately opted for the tallest model, with footrests four feet off the ground, and balancing up there, he paced around the garden like a giant stork out for its daily constitutional. Mark then writes, While each version shares many features with the others, what I tried to emphasize was the novel's pronounced comic effect, both by stressing the inordinate height of tall, skinny picuche on those lengthy stilts, so tallest rather than great or large, up there rather than on them, and by the image of a stork on a W. Fieldsian constitutional rather than a mere walk. So if that appeals to you, this is the kind of thing that is delightfully found throughout these books, is the kind of nitty-gritty individual choices that is, are made in a translation. Now what I want to ask you, Mark, is as Sarah referenced earlier, uh, we often use this expression, lost in translation. We always think about what is lost in translation. But I want to talk to you about what is gained in translation, because this is something that, again, is throughout the book, examples of how, for instance, Pope's Iliad may not be the best translation of Homer, but may be a great poem in its own right, or Lowell's imitations, or you also talk about Beckett bringing out things in Eduard's poetry through his translation that we might not even have known. And you even go so far as to show how mistranslation, Eve's apple, can enrich our culture beyond really the imaginable. So what is gained in translation? Well, um, I think what is gained in translation is the, the talent and the, you know, if I can use the word, the genius, if, if such exists, of the translator, for one thing. Um, you know, obviously, in order for this to happen, I think the translator also needs to be a writer of talent. Uh, but and somebody also of great empathy. Um, but you know, a, a translation is a reading, and I think it's important to remember that. And I think one of the things that we run into, just to, to deviate just a tiny bit from your from your, your question, I'll get back to it. Um, I think one of the reasons that we tend to think of translations as being impossible is that it starts on 
the notion that every reading of an original text that exists as a kind of a monolithic block, that there's only one reading possible. And the reality is, there are many, many, many readings possible. Reading is an active action. Um, pardon the horrible phrase. Um, so when you read something, when you read it you know, several times over, you're not reading it exactly the same way. You, know, you never dip into the same book twice, right? Um, and when someone else reads that exact same book, they're not going to be reading it the same way you are. So even to say that all of Modiano's French readers are reading one text is in fact wrong. They're reading a multiplicity of texts because each of them is bringing their own personal experience, their own you know, lack of attention, the fact that they might be thinking about what am I going to make for lunch, or the fact that they're really, really absorbed in this book at a, at a particular moment. These are all zones of reading that, that give it a kind of an active, energetic quality, a dynamic quality. And translation is, is, is really the, the same thing. In other words, that as a translator, what I'm first and foremost doing is reading it, bringing out my reading, trying to recreate that reading, and that is a creative act. And so what I hopefully I can bring to it is a certain amount of energy of my own that makes sense within the context of the English language that will, on the one hand, replicate or reproduce or represent faithfully the, the energy of Modiano's text, but at the same time will bring something to it that's different. And the, the proof of that is if, well, Nicholas just gave you one. I mean, tr different translations of exactly the same text are not going to sound the same. Different people bring different things to it. One can find merit in all four of those, of those uh, versions. One can prefer one of the other versions. You know, somebody could say, oh, the first one just sounded more 19th century, and that's how I want my Flaubert to sound. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, because I think that what that translator is bringing to it is a particular sensibility that maybe made sense at the time. You know, what I tried to bring to it was a sensibility that is you know, it's post Beckett, it's post Seinfeld. Um, you know, Bugard and Pécuchet is, is one of the great Seinfeldian novels, if you want to call it that. Uh, nothing happens, you know. They just go over and over and over in the same sort of failed circle, like like little, you know, like 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 hamsters in a cage. Um, but for us to understand the humor of that, you kind of need to have gone through, you know, the 1980s and the 1990s and, and to really understand it. Volbert's audience, when he, you know, when he died and the book was published, they didn't get it. It's what the hell is this? You know, I mean, we know Madame Bovary, Fine, we can deal with the scandalous Flaubert, but this is, like, nothing happens. What's going on? And you needed the theater of the absurd, and you needed the 1950s, and you needed Beckett, and you needed, you know, sort of a, a notion of comedy that is very, very different from the notion of comedy in Flaubert's time to really get what he was doing. And a hundred years from now, who knows how it'll be read? It'll be time for a completely different translation in a completely different register. So I think, you know, what, what one can add to that is the knowledge of where you are when you're, when you're translating, the context in which you're translating, and a way of sort of bringing it out that actually makes it speak to, to a readership of your time. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Pope and, and uh, you know, the, 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 uh, and Homer. Um, you know, Pope's Homer was a great bestseller in his time, very successful and considered for many years to be the definitive Homer. Well, you can't read it today. I mean, you can read it if you like Pope, you know, it's very flowery, and it's very, you know, sort of in these sort of English rhyming couplets, but it doesn't correspond to any notion that we have of what Homer should be in this day and age, what an epic should be, what a Greek epic should be in this day and age, because time has moved on, you know, we've moved on. So what Pope has brought to it was a particular sensibility and a wonderful facility with language. I mean, the man was an incredible stylist, and so in that regard, you could say that what he brought to it was this lovely sort of looking English, you know, sort of sensibility. Um, but I don't know how many people can actually access that anymore. On, on something you said in your answer, which is your book uh, makes a strong argument for translation not simply being a matter of translating words, but translating culture. And what I'm hearing now is that you're also translating across time, which I find really fascinating. Um, the idea that you're bringing in the experience of a culture of, of humanity, really, over the years that have passed, I mean, not necessarily in the case of Mediano, who's current, but someone like Flaubert or even Raymond Roussel, you're bringing in the time that has passed, but I'm interesting, interested in whether there's a balancing act that takes place between the history that has to be accounted for, that has passed since the author set the words on the paper, and the feeling of the words in their time, of a 19th century style or a 1920s style. And then there's also the question of the shelf life of translations, that translations 
lose their currency, as you just gave the example with Polk. So I'm interested in hearing some more from you about this question of time. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is a very tricky one. And um, I will say that I've, you know, I've cheated a lot by, by mostly translating contemporary authors, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, but, but I have done Flaubert, and I have done Roussel, and I have done a few others. Um, you know, I, I think on the one hand, what you're, what you're doing is you're trying to write a walk a tightrope between something that is representative of an older time period. I'm not going to, you know, put Flaubert's characters in a, in a Cadillac. Um, but at the same time, I don't want it to sound as if it were written in the 19th century because that would, you know, because the reader's just going to constantly be stumbling against the, the idea that this sounds false and flowery and, and you know, faux 19th century. I mean, we're, I'm not a 19th century person, you're not 19th century readers, so we have to acknowledge the fact that we're reading this for today. So it is really something of a balancing act between trying to figure out where that almost timeless quality of the work is, so that you're pitching it in a place that is neither old nor too, you know, too, neither too old nor too new, but kind of cuts to the essence of what it is. Now, that said, um, I found that one of the amazing things for me about Flaubert is that he's actually a very modern writer, which I was, I was getting to before when I talked about the sensibility. It's not only his, his viewpoint, which I think in a funny way sits much more comfortably with us today, you know, in the late 20th, early 21st century than it did in, uh, among his contemporaries in the, in the mid-19th century. But, um, but his language, there's a, a certain um, directness of style and a certain, I wouldn't say spareness necessarily, but there's a kind of a, a straight quality to him. It's not flowery, it's not ornate, you know, there's something very modern in, in our sense about Flaubert's writing that I was able to connect to. And in a funny way, uh, I was mentioning before Jean Echnos, who's a, you know, a writer of the 1980s through today, still, still writing, um, and who in a number of his works um, plays off of tropes like, uh, you know, uh, detective novels and, you know, popular culture and detective film, that kind of thing. So there's, you know, a very resolutely modern quality to it. Well, in a weird way, having worked on Eshenoz's books as a translator helped me figure out the voice for Bouvard and Pécuchet, because there's a real correspondence there. And of course, it's no accident that actually Bouvard and Pécuchet is, is Eshenoz's favorite novel. But, uh, but there, there, you know, there's something there that is really very, very modern. The other thing I'll mention is that, of course, one can play with that. And since you mentioned Ezra Pound before, um, he has uh, his, his translations of Sextus Propertius, which is, of course, a, an ancient text. Uh, he has it with a frigid air, so named. So you, know, you, can, you can also play around with that whole notion. It's interesting what you say about uh, Flaubert's language, because I translated this biography of Flaubert uh, by Michel Vinoc. And I quoted your Bouvard and Picuchet when that was quoted um, in the French. But I did actually find myself having to translate Flaubert because uh, Vinoc quotes his letters um, at great length. And the letters have actually not all been translated into English. In fact, it seems that we haven't translated many of the letters in the correspondence. Some people go so far as to say it may be his greatest work, et cetera, et cetera. It's your next project, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I wish that upon myself. But what I did want to say is that once I jump in to translating Flaubert, it was striking how the specificity makes it possible to translate him. Though the words may be rare and you have to go looking for them, and though the style might seem forbidding, he is such a great writer because he is so specific. Which means that one could nearly argue that in some case there's a right or wrong mm -hmm. with translating Flaubert. And reading your book, if there's one thing that I feel I came away with is that there's not a right or wrong in translation, because as you argue, it's a question of interpretation, of different people lending their voice. But sometimes we do have this right or wrong. Yeah, I mean, actually, let me nuance that a little bit, because, um, you know, yes, on the one hand, there are choices that are constantly being made. I'm not, I'm, you know, and different translators make different choices, and they have their reasons, and they're very talented translators that can do very different things with the same text. That said, the reality is, some choices are just bad, um, and and there are mistakes. I mean, I'm not just talking about you know you, you have the word chien, you you translate it as cat. I mean that that's the easy part. Um, I mean, there are just mistakes that are you know they're they're faults of tone, they're faults of of, of uh, syntax, they're faults of of um, of understanding. You know, they're they're faults of, of trying to bring through the entire voice of what this what this writer is trying to do um, that that one sees and. Um, 
we were talking earlier, there are a couple of uh, examples that I, that I quote in the book, and one of them is um, a, a translation of a poem by Apollinaire, uh, which, I, uh, which I particularly happen to love, uh, um, called Annie, which is about a sort of a, you know, it's a very wistful, unrequited love poem, one of his earlier ones from Alcal. And it's, you know, it's, the language is fairly straight, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit modernist in that early 19th and 20th century way, but it, it, there's, you know, it's not experimental in the sense that we would say now. It talks very wistfully. I mean, it, you really get the sense of this man looking inside this garden and sort of, you know, imagining this woman that he can't have, and, you know, it's a very kind of wistful um, uh, statement. But there's this fellow named Clive Scott, who's a translation theorist, and he um, decided to take on this poem. And I won't spoil it for you, it's in the book if, you're, if you want to see it. Uh, but it basically takes an entire page, and it looks a little bit like Mallarmé's, uh, you know, throw of the dice. It's like this kind of, you know, words scattered all over the place. He, he throws in little French phrases that have nothing to do with the original poem. I mean, it's just like this complete reinvention in the stupidest way. Um, you know, and, and I sort of look at this and saying, now, I'm all for being creative, and I'm all for taking chances, and you know, sort of getting inside the poem and coming up with something that's different from what somebody else would do. But there's also a point where you look at it and say, you know what, this has nothing to do with the original work. This is not creative, right? This is just a bad, bad exercise in self-aggrandizement, as far as I could tell. So, you know, I, I, yes, I know it's very unfashionable, but there are some things that are just wrong. <laughs> and you referred to it as not giving a spoiler for the book, but I was going to say we weren't going to honor this uh, translator with a reading of his <laughs> version here. Um, now I'm going to open a can of worms, if you don't mind. Um, frequently when people have asked me about my work as a translator and, and asked me what it is that I'm trying to do, I found myself saying that I tried to make it sound like it was written in English. What do you think about that, Mark? <laughs> Well, um, on the one hand, yes. Um, I mean, in the sense that if the original, let's say French, because we're, we're all French here, um, if the original sounds like it was written in French, then the English should sound like it was written in English, except that one of the, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit to answer this question, um, one of the objections made by certain theorists, especially in academia, to translation that's very fluid. In other words, that sounds like it was written in English or that has a you know sort of fluidity in the target language, is that it is obscuring the fact that it's a translation, that it's willfully brushing under the rug the fact that it's a translation. That's the that's the accusation. To which my answer is, on the one hand, if the original text reads smoothly, let's say, let's say somebody like Modiano, who's got a very limpid style, very kind of straightforward, deceptively simple, it just, you know, it, it just trips right off it, you know, you absorb it like it's a, you know, it's an easy drink. Um, I personally feel that I would be doing a great disservice to my English language reader by complexifying it or making it any less easy to absorb and to, to enjoy in English on the one hand, because that's not what Modiano is about. And secondly, all that said, the fact that his sensibility is a French sensibility seeps through regardless. There's no way you're going to read this and think that this was written in, in English. So I can work my language so that it has a certain kind of fluidity and a certain kind of ease to it that, in my view and my reading, mirrors the ease and fluidity of, of Moria's original. But the way he looks at the world, the way he interacts with Paris, the way he describes the street, the way he, you know, sort of presents whatever it is he's presenting, you know that this is not an American talking here. Even one who lived in Paris, you know, an expert, it's just this is a particular way of looking at the world that in very many ways, if one can typify this, is, is French. Um, in the same way that certain authors have a very Italian way of looking at the world, or a German way, or a Russian way of looking at the world, and you can translate them beautifully so that the language seems perfectly fluid and you know, within the within the the, um, the bounds of really well crafted English, but it's still not going to sound like an American or English person wrote that book. How do we deal with authors who sound foreign in their own language? This is something that I, I've had some experience with. Um, the book that Sarah mentioned that I translated, "The Falling Sky" by Davi Kopenawa and Bruce Albert, is a, a fascinating book. Bruce Albert is an anthropologist who works in the Amazon. And for some 30 years, he's known uh, a Yanomami shaman called Davi Kopanawa. And for 30 years, he recorded Davi, who, whose language is not a written language, uh, talking 
about his life. And eventually he produced what I think is a, a great poetic and political book, which is this man's memoirs, and that also encompassed the belief systems of his people. And he found a way, Bruce Albert, to write a kind of French that feels foreign to French. And so then my task was to take his French taken from the Yanomami and feeling foreign into English. And so I'm just curious, Mark, what you think about, you, you know, um, um, an example that's better known to people here perhaps is Kafka, who's known to have actually in German quite a, a stilted, unusual style, which his original translators, the Muirs, didn't really account for, but which more contemporary translators do. So I'm interested to hear what you think about that, yeah, Mark. I mean, Kafka, both of those are great examples, Kafka in particular, um, but you know, the short answer would be yes. If it is jarring in the original, then you are going to try to, you do need to try to convey some of that jarringness in, in, in English. I, you know, the last thing I would recommend or advocate is that if the if the original is jagged, that you smooth it out and make it uh, make it seem like it was you know just nice felicitous prose. Um, the trick is how to do that so that it doesn't sound artificial, and that's you know that I think again is where each individual translator's creativity and instincts come into play. You know you make choices and you 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 invent it as you go along in a funny way because essentially you're working from a language that doesn't exist in French, so you have to create something that doesn't exist in English but still has that feel and is off let's say off-putting to some extent, but not too much, because you don't want it to be so off-putting that it's more so than the, than the original French. So that, that's where you as a, as a practicing translator will gauge. Um, Kafka is a very interesting example, because you're absolutely right. The, the more recent translations by, uh, I think, Mark Harmon and um, Michael Hoffman is one, and I think Brian Mitchell has done some, uh, are paying much more attention to that aspect of Kafka's language, where he does break syntax and where he does write in a, in a slightly more, um, stilted style or, you know, a sort of unconventional German. There's something a little off about his language and part of the humor of his, uh, and part of the effect, is in fact derived from his use of German. Now, to some extent, you're never quite going to get that because, of course, he was playing specifically on the German language and culture and his own relationship to that language and culture, which, of course, is as a, you know, as an outsider, but an essay that they wrote back in the time talking about, you know, their job was to write prose in English that was as smooth and felicitous as Kafka's is in German. So well, the problem is it's not. You know, but, that was, but that was their view of it. And of course, as the spokespeople of Kafka, the spokespersons for Kafka, the people who were going to represent him and help make him the world figure that he is today, well, they had a slightly different job. You know? And the fact is that if they had represented him in that way at the time, I'm not sure that we'd still be speaking of Kafka in quite the same way. So there also is you know, a strategic temporal aspect to this, that by translating Kafka in a way that English readers could access more easily for decades, he became Kafka. And by the time uh, Harman and, and, and uh, Hoffman and the others came along, well, you know, Kafka doesn't have anything more to prove. They can go ahead and actually be more careful about trying to represent that difficulty in this. You cite some nice examples in the book of how a little goes a long way with this kind of thing. I mean, you mention made up words, for instance, like the Zex mm -hmm. in the translation. It's, is it Solzhenitsyn? Yeah. yeah. And um, the horror show. Mm -hmm. in, that's not a translation, actually. The no, horror no, show no, is no, in uh, yeah. Clockwork Orange. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. I have always avoided reading translations from languages that I can read i.e. French, because I feel there's too many books to read, there's not time, but your book has kind of made me evolve in this regard and realize that translations are works of art in their own right and that I should probably be reading, well, a lot more of your translations for starters. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, I, I would be curious to, to hear from you what are some of the great translations that you've read, particularly in, in French, from French, language that you read? Or if I'm putting you on the spot, you can dodge. I, I hate that question. Because I, I can never, I know that there are someone I can never think of. Um, yeah. What was that? I said I'm mean. You're mean. <laughs> you didn't prepare for that one. Um, I mean, great translations. I've read some interesting translations. Uh, one of them most recently was, um, uh, was the, the, the Function of the Seven, or whatever, the, I forget what the title was in English, so you didn't know that book. Uh, which I specifically read in English because knowing that it was about language and knowing that there is a lot of wordplay, and also knowing that, in fact, it's about a particular moment in French culture, which is the, you know, 
sort of talking about the great intellectual heroes of the 1970s and 80s, and it, it sort of revolves around, those who haven't read it, it revolves around the death of Roland Barthes, and sort of turns it into a kind of tongue-in-cheek mystery story that is on the one hand a, a sort of a detective story, but also a send-up of academia and a send-up of that whole generation of, of thinkers, so Soleros and Atusea and all these people are, are characters in this book, and all have their own, you know, weird ways of doing things. So knowing all of that, I was actually particularly interested in reading it in English because I wanted to try to figure out, I wanted to see what, what uh, Sam Taylor did. Um, and, and it actually is, is quite a wonderful translation. I mean, I think there are a lot of very smart um, and creative solutions to a number of thorny problems that have to do with letting an English language audience understand who these people are and what the importance was and what the context was and you know everything that was going on with the election of, of uh, Mitterrand at the time which was you know all, all uh, involved in it so there, there's a lot in there not to mention the language games not to mention the academies not to mention the jargon that they were all throwing back and forth like you know like ping pong balls so you know how do you convey all of that in English well it, it can be done so to me in a way that was a um, you know, I don't know if it quite answers your question. I don't know if it's one of the great translations of all time, but um, but it was a it, it was a fun translation and it was one that I particularly enjoyed because as a translator, I was sort of watching to see. You know, I was, I was sort of looking behind the scenes to see how he did it, uh, and and looking at the scaffolding, of course, is, is my great joy. Um, uh, I, I think one of the the great translations that I do, uh, a couple of ones that I do cite in, in the book. Um, uh, which are sort of classics at this point. Uh, one of them is is actually quite a controversial one, which is Ezra Pound's translation of Chinese poetry uh, that we all know about. Uh, it was published in 1915 in the volume called Cafe. And of course, one of the things that is controversial about it is that Pound himself knew absolutely no Chinese. Uh, so he was translating based on a, a crib, essentially, uh, a literal version that was done by a scholar of Chinese, a man named Ernest Fenelosa, who had transcribed these poems from the Chinese and written, you know, kind of almost word for word um, transcriptions and died. And then Fenelos's widow gave Pound these notebooks. And from that, he fashioned these absolutely lovely poems that, in a funny way, sound Chinese but don't, you know, but they're also beautiful poems in English. They work absolutely on all kinds of different registers. And of course, many scholars of Chinese over the decades have just reviled these because, they're, well, first of all, the man didn't know Chinese. You know, who, who's he to try to translate these poems from a language he doesn't know? But what's interesting is that if you actually look at other translations that have been done, even by poets who knew Chinese but you know, translated to English, none of them comes close. They just don't quite make it. I mean, they might be a little more accurate here and there, but the spirit of it and the, you know, the, the the incredibly touching quality of these these poems, the, the, the real joy and loveliness of them doesn't come through. There was something that Pound understood about these poems without knowing the language that he managed to convey and that nobody else has. And what's also interesting is that there are certain Chinese scholars who will actually look at these and who can judge very easily because they know, you know Chinese language fluently, um, can look at these and say, you know, there are things that Pound understood about these that he got right that nobody else did even without knowing the language. So there is a, a certain poetic instinct that can come through certain great translations. Uh, another one I mentioned, uh, we, we, you, you touched on it briefly, is uh, Samuel Beckett, who I think was a wonderful, wonderful translator. I mean, because of a, a man who understood his own language so beautifully, and then was able to understand the French language so beautifully, and play between the two of them. <coughs> um, but one of his early translations is, is this poem, is this text by uh, Paul Edouard, this, this surrealist, um, poet, and this was a, a, an excerpt from a book that Edouard wrote with André Breton, where the two of them were trying to simulate um, states of madness. So basically these were sort of discourses by, supposedly by people suffering from certain mental illnesses. So, you know, how a schizophrenic would write a text. And they sort of put themselves into the mindset and they collaborated and they wrote this thing. So Edouard wrote this one passage, which is, you know, this kind of very gushy and, you know, sort of really ardent kind of love letter that makes, of course, absolutely no sense. And uh, Beckett translated it for a, a periodical in the 1930s. 30 years later, Richard Howard, no lightweight himself, translated the same text for uh, some other book. And when you look at the two of them together, you realize that, again, Beckett understood something about this. And one of the ways he understood it, are you, are you poised to read I it? Have it? I you have it. You have it. You can. Okay. Or I, I don't want to interrupt you, though. No, well, maybe we maybe should read it, it and, then we'll, the and then, we'll, then I'll comment. Beckett? Uh, do both. Okay. Uh, here's how it sounds from Richard Howard. My great, big, adorable girl, 
beautiful as everything upon earth, and in the most beautiful stars of the earth I adore, my great big girl, adored by all the powers of the stars, lovely with the beauty of the billions of queens that adorn the earth, my adoration for your beauty brings me to my knees to beg you to think of me. I throw myself at your knees. I adore your beauty. And it's signed, yours in a torch. This is Beckett. Thou, my great one, whom I adore, beautiful as the whole earth, and in the most beautiful stars of the earth that I adore, thou, my great woman, adored by all the powers of the stars, beautiful with the beauty of the thousands of millions of queens who adorn the earth, the adoration that I have for thy beauty brings me to my knees to beg thee to think of me. I am brought to my knees. I adore thy beauty. Signed, Thine in Flames. So, you know, by, and this is, of course, this is supposed to be a contemporary schizophrenic writing, right? You know, so 1930. But somehow that one word, thou, thee, Beckett understood that by turning this into a kind of a blazon, uh, that he brought out something that was in that text, while keeping the whole, all the insanity and the, you know, everything else, he brought out this kind of ardor that was buried in that text that, that Richard Howard just couldn't do it. And I, I joke in the book that when I hear, you know, my great big adorable girl, to me it sounds like Cary Grant. You know, it's just like it ruins the whole thing. Yeah, I found that was so right on with Cary Grant. It's so apt. <laughs> you really can't, my great big adorable girl. It's, it's, uh, I was a male war bride or something. Um, so talking about pound, you bring up a, a thorny issue. You know, here's a, a Western man, an American man, translating an Eastern work, a Chinese work, and he doesn't speak Chinese. So this, this, this gets into something that you discuss in this book that I, I honestly find I have a hard time wrapping my head around, but I think it's worth bringing up here, which is the issue of translation as a, a colonizing or imperialist act, an aggressive act upon, especially, um, you, you talk about horizontal translation and vertical translation, so vertical would be from a, a very large and powerful country's language to that of a small and perhaps less powerful country, so I, I'd just like to hear you on that issue. Yeah, I mean, anything having to do with language and nationality obviously involves politics and it involves global politics, and it, it is sensitive in certain ways, and it can certainly be abused and misused, and has been many times. So, you know, there is, um, I was alluding to a school before, foreignization, and one of the things that they, one of the beefs that they have against fluid translation is that they find it a kind of a, a, an aggressive imperialistic act. In other words, you are appropriating the foreignness of the foreign work by turning it into something English. Again, my answer to that is, if the original reads well, why shouldn't the English read well? That's a different thing. But I do take the point that, you know, English, especially American English, because of the situation of the United States, because of our geopolitical situation, because of the use of English as a kind of a lingua franca in the business world, has a particular stature in the world, and it's one that needs to be used with great responsibility, which it's not always, uh, often is not. Um, and so, you know, if one is translating a work into English, especially American English, that does have a very different resonance from a work written in English being translated into, you know, Icelandic or Urdu. Um, it's just, it's not the same thing. So, um, you know, there is certainly a responsibility to represent well the other culture, the other language. My issue with the foreignization school which is that you should intentionally make it sound unlike English, you should intentionally make it sound foreign, which is something that derives from uh, some of the German thinkers like um, uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher and Walter Benjamin, you know, were very much, their, their theory was that there was this kind of pure language out there and that the, the translator should bring the target reader, you, closer to the original by sort of making the translation sound like the original so that we kind of learn what German sounds like, or we learn what French sounds like by reading the English. Um, my problem with that is that in practical terms, first of all, I think it misrepresents, it actually does violence in a real way to the original, uh, not in a theoretical way, but in an actual way. But the other thing about it is that in practical terms, what it's going to mean is that nobody's gonna read it. And so that you have this author who 
you know, very often being translated into English, just in terms of the publishing economics of it, is a way of becoming much better known. Many other translations into other languages happen because a work was translated into English first. Sometimes they're actually even based on the English translation, which is not ideal, but you know, sometimes certain translators in certain languages can only work from English, not from you know, the, the original, and so that's, that's the vector uh, by which these things become known to the wider world. The Nobel Committee apparently will not consider anybody who has not been well translated into English. I mean, these are powerful motivators, they're powerful, they're powerful tools uh, and levers. And so, you know, to on the one hand um, denigrate or disparage it, I think does a disservice to the writer, but at the same time to just sort of take a cavalier attitude that, you know, translating into English we can do whatever we want is, is also extremely dangerous. So I, I don't want to embarrass you, but I think that you've just pointed out in a roundabout way that I'm having a conversation tonight with a Nobel Prize winner because Patrick Modiano won the Nobel Prize and they must have read your translations in English. Well, there were translations before me. Actually, no, they didn't read my translation in English, and I can tell you why I know this because um, because when I had um, because I signed up the book to uh, uh, suspended sentences, which was the first Modiano that I translated. Um, was signed up two years before the Nobel, and I had just handed in, I just finished it, and I'd handed in the galleys um, to Yale University Press, and sent them in right before the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2014, and of course Frankfurt is in October, and it coincides with the announcement of the um, Nobel. So with this book not having come out yet, when I landed in Frankfurt and turned on my phone, it was full of messages. Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? So I can tell you for a fact that they didn't read my translation. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> on that note, is there anyone who would like to ask Mark a question? I have the microphone here for anyone who would like to ask a question. Yes. Yeah. And if you, if you want the book, by the way, and Mark will be happy to sign it for you, it's for sale outside after the event. That way, do we have a question here? Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, you mentioned about publishing economics and uh, also how uh, you know, English works as a vector for translation. Uh, Tim Park, the novelist, alleges that um, um, some non-English writers, in his case Italian novelists, uh, have their novels being edited, uh, basically edited in a way that minimizes regionalisms or cultural specificities with the view that to make it easy to be translated into English. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that comes in your radar? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Parks is, is uh, you know, one of the, the smartest and most curmudgeonly commentators on translation there is. Always worth reading, and he writes a lot about translation. Um, I think a lot of it is on the Paris Review daily blog, which you probably get for free. Um, <clears throat> you know, he is a translator from Italian. Italian in particular, of course, is a language and a culture that only recently was brought together under a unified you know, sense of Italianness. So the Italian language is really so many different languages, so many different dialects. I know this because you know, it's my background. Um, so what Parks is, you know, is particularly sensitive to and does become a factor in Italian literature more than with many others is exactly that regional specificity of the way language is used. Um, just one small anecdote, I remember my, one of my cousins from the south of Italy saying at one point that he'd gone up to the north and he couldn't understand what people were saying. This is in his own country and this was, you know, 20 years ago. So, it, you know, it's still very much a, a fragmented, you know, land of, of many different dialects, many different languages. Now, how do you represent that in translation? Well, I don't know that it's so much necessarily that you're flattening it out to make it more palatable to an English language audience. I think the real issue is that these are very specific linguistic uses that have a very specific uh, uh, place stamp of where they come from that an Italian might recognize, but anyone outside of Italy is not going to know. So you can try to suggest a regionalism, but you know the reality is you can't make somebody from Naples sound like he's a Cockney, you know, or or something like that. I mean, it just doesn't work, you know. So you can try to suggest it in a way, but a lot of it is going to have to be. You know, it's going to be it's going to be airbrushed. Um, I always hate to use the word lost because, of course, that's such a cliche. But you know, but it is going to be approached in a, in a slightly different way, and some of it is going to to fall by the wayside. You know, um, and ideally, a good, clever translator will be able to suggest that, possibly with a very judicious use of a couple of you know regionalisms sort of peppered in in a way that aren't obtrusive. Whatever, there, there are ways of doing it, but um, but it's not easy. You know, it's, it's like slang, it's the same thing. Slang from another language is, you know, hell on earth for translators. We hate it. There's a question there? Yeah. 
Um, I don't need this. Sorry. Okay. I'm just wondering. Suppose I think I could do a really good job on a trans translating a foreign poet. Um, what? How do I get my foot in the door? Um, well, do it for one thing. Try it out. <laughs> Um, send it in. To, there are uh, a number, especially now with online magazines, there are a number of places that do publish uh, poetry, translations of poetry. I'm sure that if you're interested in poetry, you know a lot of them, uh, what they are. You know, start getting your name out there. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's you do it. That's how, that's how you start. Do I, need, I, mean, I don't need to get some special rights or something like that. Well, if you want to have it published, uh, you know, the thing with online, of course, is it's still a little bit of a wild west, so... <laughs> You know, technically speaking, yes, if it's actual publication, whether it's digital publication or print publication, you should get the permission of the, uh, if it's a foreign writer, chances are the publisher, because very often writers don't keep their copyright in foreign languages, it's the, it's the publisher. So if you're working from a, a book, for example, you'll see on the copyright page, it'll say copyright, you know, publisher's name. Um, you can write to them. The reality is if it's one poem in, uh, you know, on an online site or an online publication, you could probably get away with it. You didn't hear that from me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll visit you in jail. But um, you know, but but uh, you know, but if it's a, a book or something like that, certainly you you should. And actually, one little piece of advice that I'll suggest to all of you who are interested in translating um, a particular work: find out first whether it's been done or whether it's under contract. I've had this happen. I've heard of this happening a number of times. One of the, the things that almost broke my heart and made me feel bad was um, somebody, I met a, a graduate student who was working on a book, um, and who was working on Mariano, and she said, oh, you know, she knew that I had, and I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to work on a book of his too, I'm, I'm, I've done half of it. And I said, oh, which book is that? And she gave me the title, and I said, oh, I hate to tell you, but I just signed a contract to translate that book with a publisher two weeks ago. And, you know, it's like, don't just jump into it, unless you're doing it for your own benefit. Um, but the, fa the fact is, the book could have been sold. There could be a translation out there that you don't know about. Um, you know, get in touch with the publisher if you're interested. I'll tell you the other thing about a foreign publisher will be happy to know that somebody's interested in repping that author or that book. Um, you're, you're doing a little of the work for it, you know, because you're, you're, you're representing them on home ground. Uh, so it, it's definitely worth your while to find out. A question here? Um, this, this kind of goes back to the question about the various forms of Italian. English has lots of forms. And so, so not only are you talking about which kind of English are you using over time, but also sort of horizontally. Are you deliberately using American English because that's, that's what you do? Or, or are there choices that you make within sort of which style of English? Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> there are definitely choices that I make, and actually I try to use a slightly neutral style, a fairly neutral style, um, which, you know, of course doesn't exist in, 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 in the absolute sense, but you can try to, I try to find expressions or uh, words that are not specifically marked as American or, or as British. And one of the reasons is that, um, a number of the authors that have translated, but yeah, being one of them, were published in not only in the United States, but in, in, in the UK. And sometimes by two different publishers, an American and a, and a British publisher. And British publishers tend to re-edit, so that even if a, a book has been translated and edited here by my publisher here, the British publisher will then go back and sort of do their own reading. And one of the things they're looking for is Americanisms. Um, yeah. and, and, I'm always surprised to find what is considered an Americanism. I mean, I do try to avoid them. You know, I'm not going to say Yahoo partner, but um, but you know, there are things that that seem to be perfectly normal usage that sometimes you, you realize that an English person will say, "Yeah, we don't really say that here." So uh, actually, the the uh, uh, Vuillard's book, uh, "The Order of the Day," was a case in point because uh, it was published here by other press and it's being published by Picador in in the UK. And the um, British editor editor who was terrific would come back with little things like, oh, we can't really say that here. And I'd say, really? You know, so then we'd have to try to find something that wasn't really English, but it wasn't really American either. And um, one of my favorites, which was actually, we, we didn't manage to find exactly the right thing, but it was very close. Um, there's one point where he says something or other, and I use the expression, that really took the cake. And the British editor said, well, we don't say that here. So we kind of, he said, you know, you should say, well, that wasn't spot on. And I said, no, I'm not going to say that wasn't spot on. <laughs> um, so we kind of, you know, went back and forth. We finally found this wonderful expression that I really love, which is the, the biscuit. And that's what we did in the English one. Tracy? Oh, thank you. So um, as a 
as a person who's been in this building for you know, 30 years struggling and struggling with French, um, I have tons of questions for you on that side of the, of the brain, so to speak, and I'll read the book. Great pleasure to try to find the answers for myself. But for tonight, given it's a Friday night, I guess this is a light question, but I was really curious about what it would mean to think about how the relationship has to go between you and a living author in order to do what you're going to do, because you know, theoretically at some point, uh, Mr. Modiano will know that it went well or it didn't, or somebody will say something, even if he doesn't speak a word of English. But clearly with Flaubert that won't happen. But I just wanted to understand what is the process? What is the sort of mechanical interpersonal process for you? It could and him or her? Yeah, uh, it could really, really vary. Um, and in a funny way, it was actually harder be with Flaubert because I didn't have him to, to ask. Um, and of course, I just assumed that yeah, I just assumed that everything that I was doing was wrong because it was full of it. Um, you know, there are writers with whom I have a, a, a close working relationship. There are some uh, with whom I've been friends for many years. Uh, you know, and I'm, even if I'm not working on their books anymore, we just see each other and go out to dinner in Paris. Uh, you know, with Modiano in particular, we've actually not met, but we've had a, an extensive correspondence back and forth. Um, so he's very aware of the translations, um, and I, 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 I'm told, I hope it's true, that he likes them. Um, uh, but certainly what, what I do write to him for is, uh, you know, his, his stories are very personal, and so he can talk about things that are historical events, but he'll couch them in a particular way or have certain details uh, about them that really just come from his own family experience. And sometimes there's no internet site, there's no dictionary in the world that's going to tell you what that means. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll go through the book and then I'll write him a couple of questions, and I always get back these, very quickly, these long handwritten letters. He doesn't do email, he doesn't do typewriter. Maybe he writes on typewriter, but he, he writes these long handwritten letters and, you know, giving long explanations of what all these things are. Uh, you know, very cordial, very gracious, and that, that's, a, to me, a perfect working relationship with, with him. Uh, with Villar, it was more email, you know, there was some back and forth about this, that, the other thing. When he saw the manuscript, we had some, you know, uh, changes to make. Um, there was one author where we did something that I normally would not do, but that the editor and I decided that there was some really, it was, a, it was a terrific book, it was a thriller. Great plot, really gripping, but there was this one subplot that was just really dumb. And we decided it, it had to go. It just would not, people would just stumble on it and they would throw the book across the room. So, you know, of course we're not just gonna do it, but I wrote to him and I said, look, you know, we've sort of read this, we kind of decided like these couple of chapters really can drop. And he was, he was terrific. I mean, he said, look, I want this book to work well, and if that's what you think, okay. And, you know, so I wouldn't have done it without his okay, but, you know, I think the book was actually better for it. It was tighter, and there was this one <laughs> subplot that I, you know, I would have kind of been hiding my face wow. if I had to, you know, awesome. almost no contact uh, with the author. So. We'll take two more questions. I would love to hear m more from you about, uh, both of you about the question of uh, dominion of a language, I mean, just for example, this conversation has been in English, you know, from the beginning, and and then, and also more about other kinds of English, uh, Australian, <coughs> and so on. I mean, and who determines, I mean, I suppose it's the publisher or the marketplace that determines the sort of translated language that you choose to translate, or, and or, of course your own skills and, and talents in that version of English, for example. And just just reflect on, I knew you mentioned earlier politics and language, and naturally it's a curiosity for us how, how the, your thoughts on, on, on that relationship and the choices, uh, and whether you could, if you, if you wish to, translate from an Australian perspective or an Indian perspective in, in English. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I won't speak for Nicholas, but I, I would say that I personally would not feel qualified to, to speak as an Indian or as an Australian or even as an English person. I spend a lot of time in London. I have a, you know, a, my ear has a sense of how it sounds. But, um, you know, I'm an American. My language is formed by the rhythms of this country, by living for, you know, X number of years in, in, in this country here. And so that's really the English that I feel that I can manipulate in a way that will do justice to the work that I'm translating. That said, as I said before, I don't, you know, I try not to make it too obviously American. So I do try to find a slightly more neutral tone, you know, I mean, I guess it would be the sort of the, the language equivalent of, uh, you know, newscaster 
accent or something like that. You know, like, you know, an accent that doesn't really exist except in TV news. Um, and you know, so it's it's a language that hopefully has some pungency to it, but at the same time is not, in most cases at least, unless there's a reason to, to do it that way, uh, that in most cases is not regionally marked as such, or it's not you know specifically American. But of course, it's based on American. You know, and if I were to, if I if I needed to try to you know quote unquote ape an Englishman's style, I would already feel on much less comfortable ground. Uh, and certainly if it were, you know, Indian English or Australian English or New Zealand English, I, I would say no. I mean, I would not be qualified. Yeah, I can only echo what Mark would say. Would said I, I would feel like a, a fraud if I tried to translate uh, in any other English than, than American. I just don't have the qualifications. And, and I think that that would be a, a very, we would be on tricky moral ground um, if, if we were, if I, or I think Mark as well, were to translate in the voice of uh, an Indian, an Australian, or anyone, it's, I have to, I think I have to translate from where I am and who I am. And then I can, I think like Mark, I, I don't want it to be too markedly American. I, I like the idea that it can travel, but um, I have to have some basic integrity um, based on where I am and who I am. I, I, just a small coda to that, um, because as I said, some of the books I've done have been translated, have been published in both the states and in, in the UK. And one of the things that um, some of the some of the British editors really wanted to do was anglicize some basic words. So you know, it's not an apartment anymore; it's a flat, and you're going up a lift, and you're you know, you put your you put the tire in the boot. Um, and you know, at a certain point, um, it's like fine if you need to do this, uh, but it really jars and. You know, I have copies of the English edition, of the UK edition of these translations that I won't give to anybody because it sounds so weird. You know, because the thing is, it's not British English. It's my American English with these funny little words kind of stuffed in there. And it, it does seem like this weird hybrid. So it's, you know. Um, Mark, this is a, um, it's a, a remarkably enjoyable read, even though it's a serious book. And um, at some point, towards the end of the book, you mentioned the fact that a lot of the uh, writers of Céline Noir uh, pretended um, that their books were translated from the American English and uh, took a nom de plume uh, to match. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, again, one of those, one of those publishing tricks that's like, it, come up a couple of times in the, in the, in the questions. Um, uh, Raymond Cano, who was the, you know, the, 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 the chief of the cinema, uh, or actually Marcel Duhamel, I guess, was the one who was running it. Um, uh, Cano was involved, but uh, they were both at Gallimard prestigious French publisher, and the, the series, the Série Noire, which is this very famous series of um, crime novels, it kind of gave us the, you know, the, the term Roman Noir, uh, of crime novels that were published in these uniform black-covered editions. Um, and after the war, there was this great cachet of being able to say, these are all translated from the American, because that's the country where Noir lives, you know. And we, of course, we do have writers like Jim Thompson and David Goodis and, you know, these various people, so they did translate those. But the fact is, there are only so many that they could translate. And so to keep the mill rolling, because they published, you know, scads of these things. I mean, these were books that you bought in the, in the train station on the rack, you know, they, they, you know, you read them in, in 10 minutes and then you go on to the next one. So to keep the, 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 the presses rolling, um, there were also a whole, there was a whole army of French writers who could sort of ape that style but had to pretend that these books were translated from the American, whereas in fact they were written straight in French. Uh, but, but if they had been known to be written in French, they wouldn't have the same cachet as, you know, as the American translation. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, Nicholas, for being here. Thank you. I'm certainly honored to have them because I count them as my friends as well. And they are the first event in our language be Languages Beyond Borders series we, you know, that we started this year at the Alliance. Um, as I said before, if you want to acquire the book, it's outside and you can pay it and have Mark sign it for you. If you want to ask him more questions, you can do so. I will make sure you have wine and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I just get much better. Yeah, yeah. And um, for those of you because I, who have maybe emailed today asking about next week's event uh, and asking for tickets, I'm afraid if you didn't buy your ticket, it's sold out and we have a wait list. So you can always go back on Eventbrite. I, there is a wait list um, system if you want to be there because we will be sending out an email like we did for tonight to people saying like, if you don't want to come or if you have something else coming up rather than coming to see Andre McKean, let us know, we have a wait list. So um, this is for you. Thank you very much and thank you Mark and Nicolas. Thank you.